Wouldn't it be easier to go with the flow? One with the world, feed the status quo. But what does that do to a human soul? In a world that says to make yourself whole, the word in deep terms says, you are not your own. The world's invitation, be self-indulgent. The word's soul fixation, live counterculture. I want to do, I want to start with a little experiment this morning. Okay, I want you to just kind of, uh, I want you to just sort of see how you feel. All right, as I, as I go through this first little bit, I want you to just track your own emotions. Like a little emotions graph inside, like if there's a big spike where you're like, oh, I, I have a reaction to that. I want you to just note it internally, okay? And maybe even think to yourself, why do I have that reaction? Why am I feeling like that? You see, this series that we're looking at, this counterculture series, it, it looks at kind of the three big players in our world of power, sex, and money. Those are, the, those are the three things, I think, that most things in our culture kind of come back to. So if you were an alien that was dropped in to planet Earth and you had, you had one day, 24 hours, just to kind of figure out what makes humanity tick, what are the three most important things, I think these three will probably be top of the list. Money, sex, and power. And I think the world is obsessed with money. It's the thing that makes the world go around, apparently, isn't it? It's, it's in our faces all the time that money is a massively important thing. There are endless amounts of books and speakers and influencers trying to convince you that they can make you rich. And then there are even more people trying to then tell you what you should do with the money you have. And if you don't have much money, it's always in your face because everything costs money, so it seems. And you're, you're constantly working out what you can afford and what you can't afford, and mostly what you can't afford. And maybe once you can afford some of the things that you think you want or need, you're aware of the things that actually you can't afford, and, and mostly we're, we're never actually satisfied. You see, we, we know the quotes, don't we? Things like, money can't buy you happiness. But we're also aware of the reality that money actually really can help, depending on what you think makes you most happy, obviously. But that's the reality. There's a, there's a Norwegian poet who I'm sure you're all aware of, a guy called Arne Garborg, um, who was like around 100 or so years ago. And he said this with money, you can buy food but not appetite, medicine but not health, soft beds but not sleep, knowledge but not wisdom, glitter but not beauty, splendor but not warmth, fun but not joy, acquaintances but not friends, servants but not faithfulness. So I want you to just take a little check on your emotions right now. When I, when I just mentioned money in a church, what was your reaction? How did, you, how did it make you feel? I think there'll be all sorts of different reactions across the room. Some of you will do the kind of this like internal eye roll where you're like, oh my goodness. Like maybe you've brought a friend along to church today or someone that you've been thinking about for ages and like they're here sat next to you right now and you're going, oh my goodness, and now someone's talking about money. Like you are paying into all the stereotypes that people would expect of a church. Do we need a new roof or something? What's like, what's going on? Maybe for you, it was more of like a, a guilt-induced exhale where you're like, oh man. You just have like this generalized sense of guilt that you're not giving enough. And today is going to be the day that someone points that out from the front. Well, I'm never going to do that. Of course I'm not going to do that. I don't know. But maybe you're thinking you're like you're stealing yourself now for the end of the morning when you're like, I'm just gonna give enough to stave off the guilt until next time someone has to talk about money at church. Maybe that's maybe that's you. Maybe for some of you, like the, the word money got mentioned and you just sat up a little bit straighter because you switched on your prosperity gospel radar. You're like, oh, oh, I wanna I wanna listen to what this person's gonna say because if they mention anything to do with the fact that if you give God this, then he will do this in your life. And I can feel the email already starting to brew. <laughs> Maybe for you, you've done like a mental money kind of roll call. You know, like just before you leave the house and you kind of pat your pockets to make sure you've got your phone wallet and keys. It's like inside your head right now, you're going, how much money have I actually got in my bag? Or what's in that account? 
oh, how much could you know if it when it comes to that moment later what what have i actually got to be able to give and you're and realize now actually you haven't listened to anything i've said so far because that's what you've been doing or maybe you're on your phone pretending to do the survey but you're actually just checking your accounts you see with all of the above you we kind of we have these reactions in us and they come from somewhere so for most of us, there'll be something that makes us just slightly uncomfortable about talking about money. And what is it, what is it in your own heart that makes that happen? Where does that come from? What is that about? I would suggest it's probably one of these things. One, you don't have enough for what you think you need. Or two, you have more than you think you deserve. Or maybe third, actually, you're not uncomfortable. Maybe you are content. There is that possibility that there's someone in the room right now who's not going, oh, money, please don't talk about it in church. See, all of us have this, this money mindset. Maybe you are the kind of person, you're fastidious with budgeting and accounts. You're all over it. So maybe for you, though, it's more like you are, you're just a head-in-the-sand person and you hope it all works out okay. And the funny thing is you're probably married to each other. There you go. Told you. Maybe for you, it's the single biggest cause of stress in your life because it's, it's all you can actually think about. Or maybe it's a lack of it. See, it's important for us to all recognize we all have an attitude towards money. But here's the thing. Money is something that is part of the created world. It's, just, it's part of our world. And as part of our created world, it is a fallen thing. It is not perfect in itself, and it is not going to be a thing that causes us to become more and more like Jesus in and of itself. It's fallen. It's tainted. Ever since people started using their little patch of land over here to grow something that those people who were farming these animals over here wanted, and they went, do you want some of this? And they went, well, yeah, what should we give you in return? There's been this trading element that has always existed within humanity. And... That's why it's worth talking about, because it's part of our world. But like all other things, despite the fact it is a fallen thing and it is tainted, it can be redeemed. It can be turned into something that is for the glory of God. Despite the fact that it's fallen and causes us then to fall short of the glory of God, often it can be something that is actually bringing us into the best that God has for us. It can be redeemed. You see, money, sex, and power tend to be the three things that an enemy uses to destroy, to destroy or distract us really, really easily. And so, you see, if money has a grip on you in your life in any way, then it can be hard to see a future where it doesn't kind of rule our thinking or our actions all the time, for better or for worse. But sometimes it can help us to see it through the lens of something that doesn't maybe have the same kind of hold over us. And that happens all through this series. See, we can then see it as something that God wants to do us good in. So, for example, there have been a few of us in this room last, a few weeks ago when, when Dave was talking about the reality of, of a kind of a Christian sexual ethic, what the Bible says about our bodies and sex and all those sorts of things. And they may have been sitting in this room thinking, oh, my goodness, I'm not sure I'm ever going to make it through this sermon. This is horrific. This is point, like, it's like he's just pointing out every single thing that's going on in my heart. And I, this is an, this is horrendous. But also, hopefully, you heard that the gospel of Jesus Christ is good news for your sex life and your sexuality. And you, maybe you were sitting there. For you, though, and, and the whole sex thing just, just doesn't have a hold on you at all. It's not like a big deal in your life. And you're kind of like, hmm, that's interesting. Yeah, good point. And there would have been all of that going on in the same room. Sex has just never felt like something in your life that needed this huge change in like, the way you think about it and the redeeming work of God to take it from something that distracts or destroys you and turns it into something that God wants to use for his glory and for your joy. And the same can be said for our money. You see, the enemy presses into each of our different proclivities, the way we're wired, the things that make us tick, and goes, I'm just going to get you to doubt God's goodness towards you in this area. And he does it to all of us. And maybe that's sex for you, maybe that's power for you. And so maybe with money, you're either sitting there this morning thinking, yeah, please, just tell me the answers so I can get this right. Or you're thinking, oh, no, please just don't talk about it. I can't handle it, not at the moment. 
Like I've got this bill and I've got this thing coming up and I've got that payment to make and I just, I just, this is not the time. See, for lots of us, our inner legalist wants to know the rules of how we can get right with God and do the right thing so that we can just tick that off our list. But the good news of Jesus applies to absolutely everything, money, sex, power, all of our lives, everything, the mundane and the normal and the extraordinary and the extreme. It all, the whole gospel applies to all of it. And that's why it's good for us to think about money. You see, your, your sex life, active in the context that God has given or restricted according to the way that God has loved us and caused us to live, is redeemed through the good news that Jesus Christ has loved you with an everlasting love. That's good news for us, however you feel. What you choose to do with your life, the power that you exert over the decisions that you make or the decisions that you choose not to make, or willingly submit ourselves to the, to the will of God, is a redeemable thing because we belong to God through Christ Jesus. We were bought at a price. And so we can give our whole lives to him. And so it is with money. Whether you think about it too much or whether you don't think about it enough, it is a fallen part of creation that finds its redemption in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And so it's a good time for us to think about it. See, if the world tells us that we should earn as much money as we can and enjoy that money as much as we can, then we need to look and see if actually the word of God says something slightly different, don't we? For that, we're going to listen to a guy called Agur. Um, might not be the natural place you think we might go, but in Proverbs 30, there's a guy called Agur, and his sayings were kind of compiled. His name means compiler. So we don't, we don't actually know a lot about him, so whether that was his actual name or it just happened to be a fortunate career choice. But he's, he's got these wise sayings, and that's what it says. It says it's wisdom. It's inspired by the Holy Spirit. This is God speaking through these ancient sages to us today. And it's foolishness for us to ignore these kind of words. So it's worth listening to. So let's have a read together. It says Proverbs, in Proverbs 30, verses 7 to 9. Two things I ask of you. Lord, do not refuse me before I die. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. I don't know what you, uh, what you know about what the Bible says about money, but I think these verses maybe surprise us one way or the other. See, if, you, if you've grown up hearing preaching that's telling you God wants you to be rich, these verses make you go, oh, hold on, what? Why would someone pray not to be rich? But equally, if you've grown up hearing that actually Christians should live like just above the poverty line so that everyone will know that you are a Christian because you have nothing nice. Then this is also surprising because it sounds dangerously like praying to be kind of comfortable. So what on earth do we do with these verses? He's saying, God, please don't let me have, sorry, he's saying, God, please don't let me have too much and please don't let me have too little. Please just let me have enough because if I have too much and I have too little, I can't handle either. Anyone else feel a bit like that? But well, it might be nice to find out if I could, one way or the other. But it might surprise you to hear, throughout the Bible, actually, God, God seems quite content that some people are very, very rich. And some people aren't. But what he is really interested in every single time is what people do with what they have what their life is like with what they have. And Agur here knows that it's really hard to be really rich and not feel in your heart like, I did this. This was me. I am the Lord of all things, and particularly my bank account. I have been brilliant with my money. Most of the really, really rich people, like the top 1% wealth in the world kind of people, when they're interviewed, they say something like, I, I just worked harder than anyone else, and I got really lucky with the timing. Only one of those things can actually be true. Only one person in the world ever has worked harder than anybody else. So it's an exclusive statement, isn't it? So it cannot be true. Maybe, they, maybe there is an element of just, they just got lucky with the timing. But you see, as soon as we feel like our success entirely depends on what we do, on how hard we work or how well we do, well then, at that point, we put ourselves in the God seat. 
We say it's all about me and how well I do. And when we're God, well, we don't need God anymore, do we? Because I've got it, I've got it covered. And the alternative is the request that God actually spare us from poverty because then we know, actually, again, we're going to look to ourselves to fix the problem in ways that don't fix the problem. Actually, rather than looking to God, we put ourselves in charge. He says, I, I, I can't trust God to give me all that I need, and so I'm going to take what I need from places that I shouldn't be taking it from. His point is, I know I can't handle either because in either scenario, I'm going to look to me and not to God. I think there's also a scenario where we're right in the middle and we also don't look to God. But this is the point he's trying to get us to see. That is the unifying factor, is that money isn't the issue. Our heart is the issue. You see, poverty and riches cause us to both look away from God and look to ourselves. And maybe, maybe it's less than of a money mindset, but like a, a heart attitude towards God that is played out through these things. See, it's, that is at the core of any of our, our reactions, isn't it? When you heard, we're going to be talking about money this morning, or maybe as you've been just listening, you're going, hold on, no. Where do those reactions come from? Is it that I want to be God? I want to be in charge of everything, and I can hold it all. You can't tell me that I can't. Maybe it's actually that our heart is most interested in itself, and not God, and certainly not others around us. Hebrews 13 verse 5 says this, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, I'm going to make sure you have plenty. Don't worry about it, guys. No, that's not what the Bible says. He says, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. See, God's revealed wisdom to us to our money troubles, rich or poor, isn't a financial plan. Though that can be good. A financial plan is a good thing. Budgeting and accounting is a, is a helpful thing. But actually, his point is to remind us of what we have in Christ Jesus. To remind us that he will never leave us and that we have more than we could ever possibly imagine in him. And so to remind our hearts of, of all that we have in Christ Jesus, I've just got this, this tiny little list of, of stuff that you have. <coughs> if we just flick to the next slide. This is true of you if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ. You are a child of God. You're Jesus' friend. You're no longer a slave, but a son and a daughter, or a daughter even. You've been adopted. You're an heir of God. You're united with him in one in spirit. You've been forgiven of all your sin. Next slide. You've been washed and sanctified and justified in the name of Jesus. You're righteous and holy. You're a saint. You're a new creation. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. There is plenty for us to be going on with. There are so many blessings for us in Jesus Christ that whilst we might have trouble in this world, and you know what Jesus promised us that, he, that we will? We have so much in him. Never will I leave you and never will I forsake you, he says to us. Now your attitude towards money, both and your attitude towards money works this way, you know this. It's not just your money, but it's actually your attitude towards other people's money too. Have you ever noticed that coming out in you? It's a really good pointer of how you are getting on in your spiritual maturity. For Christians, money and how we react to it and how we feel about it and how we talk about it and what we do with it is a really good pointer of, of how you're doing with Jesus. See, so you find yourself constantly worrying about your own money. We need to look to Jesus. If you find yourself constantly worrying about other people spending their money and judging them for how they're spending theirs, you need to look to Jesus. Because God has never said, never will I leave you. Sorry, God has said, never will I leave you. That was close. Nearly changed the Bible there. God has said he's never going to leave us. He's never going to forsake us. And I know what is going through your head right now. Because I thought the same thing as I was looking at this. Well, that's fine, but you don't know the reality of my situation. The reality is this. If that is not enough for you, there will never be enough for you. Have you ever read um, other parts of the Bible, like the Old Testament particularly, or just other parts of history, 
or, or maybe even, to be honest, just looked at kind of other religions, and it's talking about these idols, these idols that are kind of in temples and places, and you've just sort of thought to yourself, and I want you to be honest now, have you thought to yourself, how stupid must these people have been? To, to like bow down to, this, to these things made of, of metal and wood. Like, I would never be that dumb. I just, I just can't get it. So this is Dagon. He's the little uh, merman. I don't know if that's a thing. But there's this wooden statue, and uh, you can read about it in, in Judges and 1 Samuel, and these people bowing down to this statue, and then the, the story goes that they, they captured the Ark of the Covenant, the very presence of God, brought it into the temple, and then Dagon, the statue, falls down in front of the presence of Yahweh, the living God, and they prop him back up, because that's what you need to do with idols, and then the next day they come in again, and his arms have fallen off. That's Dagon. Or maybe, you know, this is the ne ne statue of Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel, this enormous golden statue, and they're forced to, to bow down to this, to this God-man that he thinks he is. And then there's the golden calf in the book of Exodus. You can take your pick. And, and our educated and thoroughly modern minds think to ourselves, I would never bow down to this statue made of metal and wood. It just makes no sense. And then we sacrifice our time and our energy and our relationships for the sake of notes and coins made of metal and wood. And we bow down at the altar of, of self-sacrifice. We look back at this, this ancient world, and rightly so, we, we, we go, child sacrifice? What, what, what were they thinking? And then the super successful CEO who works 70-hour weeks and never sees his children at all for the sake of affording a holiday so that they can take the nanny with them so they don't have to see their children on that holiday. You know, maybe the sacrifice of childhood, there's no, there's no bloodshed, but there's a sacrifice. There is a death on the altar to worship of wealth and money nonetheless. The Aramaic word for wealth, money, property is mammon. It's this God with a small g that demands our worship. It's the word that Jesus uses when he says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. God and money. Friends, mammon is alive and doing very well in our day insidiously creeping into every aspect of our lives. Tim Keller said this, money flows effortlessly to that which is its God. Money flows effortlessly to that which, was, which is its God. If you want to keep your life free from the love of money, you need to, you need to know what's happening with your money. I want to just encourage you to, to this week maybe, just take a look at where your non-essential spending is going. So not the mortgage, the rent, the bills. Not, and not so that you can just feel terribly guilty about that takeaway or that subscription or whatever it is. But so that you can, you can actually know what is happening with your money, which gives you an opportunity then to repent and turn to God and go, I didn't even think I was spending any money on that. And actually then God can redeem these things, but we can't do anything with it if we don't know. See, normally around this time of year, over these kind of weekends, so it's after half term, it's far enough away from Christmas, we have gift day as a church. Over two weeks, we, we, are, we have an opportunity to give in to the work of the church, and um, we were planning on doing that again. And, and most of you who've been around for some time would have been going, oh, I know where this is going. This is what we do. And giving is a, is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And we were planning on doing that again over these weekends, particularly because as a church, we are, we've planned to be running on a deficit budget. So we, we knew this year, and probably for the next couple of years, we're going to be spending more than we have coming in. We knew about it. It was a planned thing. But, we, we, well... We could have also had, we've got, we've got the boathouse. I don't know if you know about our boathouse. It's the, it's the place where the, the staff team work and we run some of our ministries out of there. It's a building that we felt God lead us to and guide us to. And so there's stuff to do there. There's work to do on that. And so we could have a gift day giving towards that. But 
we're not having a gift day today. Instead, what we're doing today is we are, we're going to celebrate the goodness of God over the, this, this little God with a small g of mammon. Because the reality is that the, amongst the people in this room and amongst the people across Life Church and our other sites at the Boathouse and West End, the reality is our, our, our deficit of almost £100,000 has been covered. That's kind of crazy. £100,000 that we were thinking we weren't going to have and we planned to not have. We were going to cover it with reserves and savings that we've had. We don't need to because through the generosity of the gift day that we had earlier in the year, but also a few very substantial one-off gifts from people who, who walk amongst us. There's no deficit. That doesn't happen in our world. Deficits just get added to. Borrowing increases borrowing. And yet today, we can celebrate that God has provided for us. We're also able to complete the work on the boathouse that we're wanting to do. So to put some kitchens on a couple of levels so that we can serve the different ministries that are happening in those spaces. To put in some of the engineering work that needs to make sure that those things can be used into the future. But out of the generous giving that has already been given. Now, if you know the Old Testament, you'll know there's Old Testament stories where they would celebrate a victory over an enemy by like making a pile of stones or they'd like rename a place or something like that. These are days for us to celebrate victories over mammon. Because there is a group of people before me and who I spoke to last week at West End and I'll speak to this evening at the boathouse who've gone, no, I'm not playing the world's game. I'm going to give in to something that lasts beyond enjoyment this weekend or something that's just going just to fulfill me. And we give out of that generosity to others. And I, I want to say well done. I always really want to say thank you at these moments, but you're not giving to me. You're giving to God, and so many of you have been so faithful over so long that these are days for us to celebrate because it is the goodness of God, and it is something to be commended for. When I speak to other people about our church, when I speak to people about how church works, they don't understand, and I have no explanation. It doesn't make sense. People giving away tens of thousands of pounds in our day makes no sense. In 2 Corinthians 9, Paul tells the, the Corinthian church of, of how much he has boasted of their generosity and kindness to others. I get to do that about you guys to other people in other contexts. All glory to God, but, but we are giving to the glory of God. It's such a joy to be able to do that about Life Church. And the thing is this, it is a witness to a world that simply cannot comprehend that people would just give their money away freely. Under no compulsion whatsoever. I want you to think, if you went to your workplace this week, or your friends, or your, one of your neighbours, and you said to them, I'm going I'm to save 10% of my money for that dream holiday. Just over the next year, I'm going to save 10%. They go, good on you. Yeah, you deserve it. Great financial planning. Well done. And then maybe you go to another person and you say, you know, you know we came into a bit of money. Well, we're going to use some of that to, to remodel the kitchen. And they go, yeah, you've earned it. Yeah, you go for it. Good, good, good move. But if you went to those same people and you said, I'm planning on, uh, I'm planning on saving 10% of my money this year and I'm going to give it to support a friend who can't pay their bills this month. Or I'm going to give it to this ministry that I, I have nothing to do with. I don't really actually know all the ins and outs of what happens there, but I know it's a good thing. They would reply to you, are you insane? Or they would say to you, are you part of a cult? Or they would say to you, do you want to talk? Because it makes no sense. Maybe you might say something like, I'm going to give a load of my money that I just came into to a church that means that we can keep meeting in all sorts of places across our city so that someone might hear something that could change their lives. That's what we're part of. And it makes no sense to a watching world. They will say, you're insane. Don't you know what you could do with that money? And God through you gets to say, yep. I know what I could do with that. But what I am going to do with it is more than I could possibly ask or imagine. Because when we put it in God's hands, it does incredible things. And you see, this is where it has all of its outworking in our lives. Everything we have comes from the giver. Your money isn't 
your money. It's, it's been entrusted to you for a bit. Like I said, God, is, God seems to be very happy with a whole load of people being really rich and a whole, a whole load of people not being very rich. And what he is interested in is what we do with what we have. But everything we have is a gift from a gracious God. And the question is, what are you doing with it? There's John Wesley, who was a, a preacher in the 18th century, and he said this, earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. That's a, that's a biblical perspective on money. To give to God through giving to others, and in doing so, what happens is we live such a radically countercultural life that it ends up standing out to other people. There's a guy called Leslie Newbigin who is a missionary and an author, and he said, we should live in the kingdom in such a way that it provokes questions for which the gospel is the answer. See, our lives should look like our money was never ours in the first place. And that should cause, cause people who, who know what we do to ask questions that the only satisfactory answer is, I'm free from the love of money. Because God has promised that he will never leave me or forsake me. And he demonstrated it so fully on the cross. Now, that, that kind of assumes that you're close enough to other people with your life that they might actually know what you do and roughly how much you might earn. But that's a sermon for another day. So the question that we inevitably come to is this. What does this look like then? Because I know we want, we want to just satisfy the illegalist. We want to tick off the thing that says I can feel, you know, okay before church leaders and before others and before God. I want to know how I compare to other people. How much should I give and who to? You see, this is where a word of warning needs to be said. If you think that an amount or a percentage that enables you to feel like you can compare yourself favorably to others around you is what God is wanting and you're not going to feel guilty, then, friends, you've missed the point entirely. God doesn't want an amount of money. He wants your heart. And right now, if those, if those initial reactions to money again are just resurfacing because it's like money and church, ugh, there's probably some kind of barrier between your heart and God, and it's probably money-related. And the beauty is that we get to bring those things to God. He's the one who breaks every chain. He's the one who sets us free. He's the one who gives us all things. He's the one who's promised he will never leave us or forsake us. If you do want an answer, C.S. Lewis said it like this, I don't believe one can settle on how much we ought to give. I'm afraid the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. In other words, if our expenditure on comforts, luxuries, amusements, etc., is up to the standard common amongst those with a similar income to our own, we are probably giving away too little. Money flows effortlessly to that which is its God. Today, there's, there's no gift day. There's no appeal towards some kind of new visionary push. There is simply an invitation to put Jesus as God in every area of your life. To, to tear down idols made of metal and wood. Mammon. And to give your whole self to God. And so if that looks for you like, like starting or changing what you're giving, for more or less, do it. If it looks like a one-off gift... To the church or to someone else, do it. If it looks like praying with someone because you are facing a financial situation that is causing you worry, do it. If it looks like giving an anonymous gift to someone else so that they can't say thank you, we really must sort something out, do it. There's a beauty in not, knowing, not letting your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Because if we give with the expectation of a, of a reciprocal nature of some sort, even if it's just the thank you. Again, are we free? I don't know. If it looks like you learning how to budget to enable you to give in the long term, do it. But if it looks like anything other than giving freely and cheerfully, hilariously, as it says in 2 Corinthians 9, don't do it. Please because God is way more interested in your heart than he is in your wallet. He isn't after your money. He is after your heart because he loves you. 
I want to pray for us. Can I invite the band to come and lead us again in just a moment? Why don't we stand for a moment together, if you're able to? <coughs> Friends, these are the things of our day. These are the battlegrounds that we line up along. And these are moments when we need to look to one who has already won a victory for us, not try harder and do better. Romans 8 says, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if, you, if you're feeling any sense of, man, I've been getting this wrong, I, sh- I just feel so guilty, that's not from Jesus. He might be convicting you and helping you to go, yeah, I need to change some stuff, but there's no guilt. There's no shame. There is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And so we can come and we can freely worship him. And we need his help to do that. So let me pray for us. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are, you are active in this place. And through the words of, of scripture and as we've kind of brought them out into the light today, you've been doing stuff in our hearts. And the reason you've been doing stuff in our hearts is not so that Life Church might have a bit more money in the account but because you are so desperately interested in in the very core of who we are. And Lord, things creep in so easily that we want to just bow down to, we want to give our lives to, so that we might be more comfortable, or we might be richer, or we might be whatever it is. But Lord, you're the only one who promises that you will never leave us. You will never forsake us. Lord, we are not stupid enough to think that money will will sort out our problems, but but we are easily led. (laughs) We are easily led to think that it will help. But Lord, when it's in our hands and not yours, it distracts and it destroys us. And so, Lord, we come to you and we establish you again as king on the throne. We bring everything we have before you because it all came from you. Lord, I want to pray for my friends here. Lord, that if there are things we need to do to change in the secret place or maybe something that's going to be read by one of our trustees and then we notice a difference in the account, Lord, let it all be to your glory and let it be for our good. We want to be people sold out for you, Jesus, because there is no one better than you. We love you, Lord. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing, and I want to just encourage you to use these moments as, a, as an opportunity to build a pile of stones, change the name of a place, do, do something in your heart that says, God, you've spoken to me this morning, and I'm not, going to, I'm not going to just think that was a good thing, and oh, that, I said some interesting stuff that I've never thought about before, but let this change you. Do something about it. If you need to talk to somebody, come and talk to somebody. I'm going to be down here. I'm going to be down here at the end as well. And there'll be some of the people who would love to pray with you. So you don't have to come down immediately. But if you want to, what better way than to stick two fingers up at Mammon and say, you're not the God of me. Let's come to Jesus.